Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'd like to um, welcome you to this SNEA Computational Memory and Storage Initiative sponsored presentation. In today's presentation, we'll be discussing how to optimize data intensive workloads by accelerating disaggregated storage. Before we jump into the presentation, I'd like to just quickly cover the Bright Talk user interface. First, some of the graphics and text in the presentation may be slightly small. So I'd recommend enlarging your viewing area to full screen. This can be accomplished by clicking on the box outline in the upper right hand corner of your browser window. Next, I'd like to encourage everyone to make this presentation interactive by asking questions of your presenter. You'll find a chat box on the right hand side by clicking on the question mark. At that point, a window will open on the right hand side where you can type your questions to the presenters. We do have a full agenda today in order to keep uh, and ensure we get the presentation completed on time. We'll be answering the questions at the end of the presentation. Often we have such a great precipitate participation that we can't cover all the questions in the allotted time. If this happens, we do release a blog to the SNEA website that contains all the questions that were asked during the presentation with the corresponding answer. Also, we frequently get requests for the presentation, which we will make a PDF version available. You can click on the announcements icon on the right-hand side within the Bright Talk window and download it there, or it will be made available from the SNEA website after the webinar. Finally, we do request that you rate this presentation when you are finished watching it. You have an option of rating between one and five, five being the best. Uh, there is also a comment and suggestion area. We'd love to hear from you. We value your comments as they help us improve the quality of our future presentations. Next, I'd like to introduce the uh, presenters here today. Myself, Tim Lustig, I'm a the co-marketing chair from the CMSI at SNEA. I'll be your, uh, <coughs> be the moderator during this presentation. We have two uh, individuals who will be presenting. Uh, Kefir Wolfson is currently a senior system architect at PlyApps with over 15 years experience, including many years at Dell and EMC and Intel, where he has designed, developed, and integrated enterprise level products in different IT technologies. Kefir has a deep understanding and experience with cloud native applications, virtualization, data protection, networking, and storage technologies. Welcome Kefir. Also John Kim. Uh, John Kim is currently the Director of Storage Marketing at NVIDIA. John has a rich storage background, having spent years at EMC, uh, Dell, and NetApp, and also at Mellanox, where he did product marketing and built joint technology solutions with partners. John is also the Chair of SNEA's Networking Storage Networking Forum. A few things about SNEA before we begin. Uh, this is something that our lawyers, lawyers make us cover. This shouldn't surprise anyone. It's just standard legal talk. The material that should be be seeing today is copyrighted by SNEA, and any use of the material within the presentation is permitted as long as the slide is reproduced in its entirety and SNEA is referenced as a source. Uh, be aware there are no warranties expressed or implied by the information presented. Use it at your own risk. And as this is a SNEA um, presented uh, presentation, we just want to give you a little bit of information about SNEA for those who don't know it. SNEA is a global not-for-profit association dedicated to a advancing the adoption of storage technology. Uh, we do so using our vendor neutral status to develop industry-wide standards for which we enlist the help of subject matter experts in our membership community. And then we provide marketing and promotional programs to aid the adoption. SNEA so, you know, also provides an extensive range of ed educational material on storage technologies to help the industry and storage, users com storage user community to better understand the implementation and deployment challenges. Our education material takes many forms, including webcasts like this one. And you'll see during our presence of many industry events, giving talks on technology subjects. Next, I just want to cover real quick what CMSI is. Um, and in a nutshell, CMSI is the Compute, Memory, and Storage Initiative that centers around the education and evangelizing computational storage, persistent memory, and solid state drives as the industry drives towards combining processing with memory and storage architectures. And without further ado, just jump into the agenda real quick. Uh, we're gonna be covering the background on disaggregation. We're going over the uh, benefits of using a DPU to offload the disaggregation and talk a bit about the modern storage challenges and requirements that are evolving. We'll jump into a roadmap to uh, disaggregated architectures, talk about how storage data processors uh, are used with both block and KV API, and talk about how tomorrow full disaggregation with DPU and storage data processors will benefit 
computational storage. We'll go over some use cases and some key takeaways. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to John Kim. Thanks, John. Thank you, Tim. All right, let me get started. So it's useful when we talk, before we talk about storage data processors and DPUs, uh, it's good to talk a little bit about, briefly, about where storage has come from and what the challenges are with storage. So of course, one traditional way of doing storage is local storage. You put storage in every server. It acts alone. It lives alone. It, it takes, it's uh, used by just that one server. That's easy to buy, easy to set up, but it's hard to share or you can't share it. So it's inefficient. You usually have low utilization and it's difficult to protect, meaning backup or replicate uh, or restore. And it's hard to manage at scale. It's easy for the first server or first 10 servers, but when, or maybe even 20, but when you get to 50 or 100 or 1,000 servers, now it becomes a big hassle to manage it, uh, provision it, use it, monitor it, and so forth. So traditionally, the next step, especially in enterprise, has been go to SAN or NAS. And this is networked storage. And this is easy to share and protect. It's usually efficient. You usually get a high utilization, but it's potentially more expensive. You're usually paying for uh, a proprietary controller from a well-known storage company uh, and you control and as you get to faster SSDs and bigger SSDs there's the risk um, and faster networking there's the risk of the controllers might become overworked or overloaded Kafir will talk more about that in, in detail and there also can be networking limitations because basically all the storage traffic has to go over the network connections out of that storage controller to get to the different servers that are using it so how do we deal with this one way is to do disaggregated storage. And people often ask, well, what does this mean? First, disaggregation means to separate the components. So you usually separate storage and compute. You know, more challenging is to separate the CPU and the memory or separate the network from the CPU. And those can also be done, but there are some other uh, challenges for that. So the most common type of disaggregation is in fact to separate the storage and the compute as we've shown in this diagram. So in a typical converged or local storage design, every node has network memory, a CPU, maybe also a GPU and storage. In a traditional disaggregated design, uh, which could this, and this picture actually looks like it could be SAN or NAS, uh, you have the network memory and CPU or GPU in the server, and then the storage is separate. And if the storage is centralized and connected by a network and all the storage intelligence lives in the storage array, that's usually a SAN or NAS solution. And if you distribute the storage intelligence or the file system uh, or some of the storage computation to the different nodes, then it could be a different kind, what we might call disaggregated storage or distributed storage. So by disaggregating, you get balanced resources, better performance, and you can separate the server administrator from the, or the, and the storage from the cloud infrastructure administrator, and you get better security isolation. But there's still potential challenges with this, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. And there are also potential solutions, uh, technology solutions to meet those challenges. So a little more background. So this, we're gonna talk about computational storage and how it fits with an SDP and a DPU. So let me talk about what is a DPU, why is it relevant? DPU means data processing unit, and it's traditionally a type of smart NIC, which also includes some kind of programmable cores. Uh, in this example shown here, there are, they are ARM cores, but it could also be FPGA cores, it could be RISC-V cores, it could be uh, x86 cores, but the key is to have some kind of programmable CPU cores combined with the networking and some kind of accelerators. So uh, typical accelerators are built into a DPU for networking, security, remote management, uh, monitoring, telemetry, and the key is that you're effectively putting a computer in front of the main computer, or you're putting this little uh, specialized data processing computer inside and in front of the computer, but logically it's in front of the main computer for all the data traffic and all the I.O. So this frees up the server CPU to run applications. You have more CPU to run the application because a lot of these infrastructure tasks are moved to the DPU. And you can also reduce the cost of storage servers because with the right DPU, in some cases, uh, you can actually replace the x86 CPU in the storage node. The DPU is not usually meant to replace the uh, x86 CPU for the actual applications, but it can sometimes replace the CPU in a storage node. Uh, which reduces the cost and simplifies those storage servers. You get additional security isolation and a great use case is that uh, many people don't know that Amazon runs a DPU, their own DPU called the Nitro in most of their servers in AWS and probably all the advanced servers. And it does pretty much what I've talked about here. So obviously AWS is not run by a, a bunch of dummies. They're pretty sophisticated. They specialize in scale, performance and 
minimizing cost. And they've determined that nearly every high performance server they have in AWS should run a DPU uh, to help offload exactly these things. And here's an illustration showing how you use a DPU. So the typical tasks, and it varies, they're different DPUs from different vendors and they have different types of processors and different types of programming models and different things they offload. But generally they're offloading some combination of management, storage, security, and networking. And the advantage is you go from dedicated appliances, you go to a software-defined infrastructure or software-defined data center, uh, as we've shown here. But when you do that and you're running everything, all this storage, security, networking software monitoring is running on the CPU. And that sucks up all these CPU cycles and limits how much application you can run. So on the right-hand side, we see if you offload that to the DPU, now suddenly more, more or all of the x86 CPU cores are available to run the applications, whether they're VMs or containers. And that's part of the reason why you get the efficiency and cost advantages as well as faster performance by moving that networking, security, uh, and then possibly some of the storage software like a, a file system agent or some lightweight uh, storage management software onto the DPU and taking it off of uh, offloading it from the x86 CPU. So that's the basic idea of a DPU. And now we're going to learn more about uh, you know, how that uh, benefits you as you go to computational storage and perhaps adopt a storage data processor. Kafir, let me turn it over to you now. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. So uh, John talked about the DPU and its benefit to storage and offloading and network security and all of these other great functions. First, before we dive into um, what John mentioned, the storage data processor, let's look at what SNEA defines as computational storage. Well, SNEA defines computational storage as an architecture that provides computational storage functions coupled to storage, offloading host processing or due to movement. So in this slide, for example, we see on the left-hand side that the legacy, a legacy compute and storage architecture in which all the storage functions are managed directly by the CPU. On the right-hand side, we see several computational storage device types. Um, a computational storage drive on the right, and it adds compute capabilities to a single SSD, and a computational storage array on the left-hand side, which aggregates several SSDs in the backend, exposing one or more devices to the host. Uh, both computational storage drives and arrays have a compute engine inside that can be used to perform various functions. Uh, functions can be storage services like compression, encryption, deduplication, or RAID, or non-storage services like database application, video, or data analytics, um, AI, or machine learning functions, and more. So the SNEA Computational Storage Technical Working Group and Special Interest Group, they help define these architectures and more. And also the APIs in order to have a standard and with the standard application and system designers can define their own computational storage functions and use these computational storage devices to execute functions directly on their data when and where the application requires it. So before uh, we go into the computational storage example we have today, let's look at the issues we're facing with storage today, which would require such an advanced solution. So as many of you know, Moore's law is not holding anymore. In the last 10 years or so, the CPU performance improvement rates have been slowing down more and more. On the other hand, storage performance is growing exponentially with NVMe devices today doubling performance on each PCI generation and continuing to grow much faster than CPU performance. This causes an imbalanced server architecture. In order to find the balance between CPU and storage, a lot more servers are required. If you want a high performance cluster, you must, put, you must put less capacity per node. And contrary to an archiving use case where the data is just stored on the disks, here in this talk, we're focusing on live data, on high uh, bandwidth, high performance applications that constantly crunch and query the data. This requires more uh, or faster data processing. And when we say imbalanced service architecture, we mean that the CPUs are not able to utilize to their fullest the SSDs that could be connected to them. In the following slide, 
we go. Um, we broaden this to more challenges with broad SSD adoption for high performance application. We already talked about imbalanced server architecture in the previous slide, but the second challenge is amplified data. Although a CPU on its own could issue a lot of IOPS, millions of IOPS per second, the data we use is actually persisted in databases and data structures, such as vtree and LSM trees, uh, data structures, and they have inherent data amplification, Re write amplification, read amplification of up to even 100x, and also space amplification of up to 6x. Even if we improve the compute bottleneck like we, we mentioned, we still need to give uh, improvements to the IO traffic, this data amplification, in order to improve the overall performance. Um, we, we'll talk about it, but these databases have these storage engines, which have a lot of compute amplification. So they also contribute to the CPU shortage. Um, by the way, the amplified data, the write amplification, has uh, a higher effect on SSDs related to endurance, especially when looking at cost-effective larger capacity SSDs. QLC drives, quad-level cell, they have lower endurance to begin with. The last point here is inefficient system re reliability, which related to endurance, actually. Higher density nodes, means servers with more, C with more SSDs on them, would give her better performance and seem to reduce costs, but they have a reliability cost if SSDs are not well protected. Even if we overcome the compute and data amplification issues we discussed and scale up the node instead of scaling out to more server sprawl, the added number of drives per server would multiply the failure rate. So handling drive failures can be done with various methods, um, it's usually done the Razor coding algorithms, such as RAID 5 and RAID 6. Until now, though, infradmins have not allowed for traditional RAID cards or RAID software in their systems. Well, that's due to several reasons. Uh, there's, a, there's a large performance hit during normal operations. Also, there's a drive endurance reduction due to added RAID amplification, and that's counterproductive to what RAID is trying to achieve. And also, in case of a disk failure, typically a long rebuild, which could take hours, process begins, and then during which the performance drops drastically. And that might render the host not really usable for real-time high-performance applications. So inefficient reliability means we're again scaling out to more servers instead of scaling up. So we've seen that storage is a complicated topic and disaggregated storage even more. Hyperscalers and enterprises today use direct attached storage, DAS, for a high performance database, although it's a higher cost. And that's because disaggregated storage does not perform well enough, and we'll see why. We'll also talk about how key value concepts will help us address these problems. Um, on this slide, we'll see a roadmap from what we call yesterday's compute-centric approach through things that can be done today in a single server to tomorrow's fully disaggregated data-centric approach. On the left-hand side here, we see a traditional CPU-based server architecture that's still prevalent in most data centers today. Due to the problems we discussed earlier, more and more servers are added in order to meet performance needs. Uh, this increases CapEx and OPEX. Kathir, did, did we lose you there? I'm trying to move the slide. John, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. No. Oh, okay. I just I, okay. I, I oh, lost sorry. audio for a second there. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Um, so in the middle here, we see a way that many of these inefficiencies can be addressed by adding a local storage data processor. This is a dedicated hardware accelerator that falls under the computational storage domain as a computational storage device. Like the devices we talked about earlier, uh, this one's a computational storage array. Mm. 
it's a, <clears throat> sorry, the storage data processor can introduce novel message of managing storage by introducing efficient data structures, which facilitate data services such as data reduction, reliability, snapshotting, and more. Uh, this storage data processor would expose, for example, a block device to the server OS while improving performance on all these services. So that's why it's a computational storage array. It hides behind it or next to it SSD devices, multiple SSD devices, and it performs all these functions, accelerates them in hardware, and allowing a faster processing by the host. Note that the network here on this model is could be with a DPU or not, but we're still talking about hosts with x86 CPUs or similar, and that's why you call it a compute slash data hybrid approach. On the right-hand side, under tomorrow's, we see a complete disaggregate model. As you can see, the CPU node and the storage node are separate. We've removed the CPU from the main, di main um, box here in the middle, and it's on a separate box on the side. It, it runs the apps, and the storage it runs separately as a storage node. We've added a DPU in there, which you would do, would do all the traffic control and also perform some computational functions required. And it can also do all these great things that, um, that John mentioned, uh, isolation, security, scale, and cost. And we'll see that if we disaggregate storage with a DPU alone, it's not enough. The performance would be below par. Below par. And if we're just working with a storage data processor, it will not give us the full benefits of cost effectiveness and security that we, that we want. So what we want to do is combine both a storage data processor and a DPU in a better, to better together model. And we'll use a novel API to reduce data amplification and thus achieve a performance, secure, robust, and essentially the most cost-effective disaggregated solution for high-performance applications. But let's start with focusing on what we can into. So, Kafir, I think we. As we said, uh, we're going to add. Oh, yeah. Kafir, I think we lost a sound. You're back now. So maybe if you could just start over your audio for this slide, or start over with your narrative sure. for this slide. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so. As we said, we're going to add a state storage data processor, this computational storage array. And it would typically have a non-volatile RAM to allow persistent cache for better performance and an abstraction layer, which we'll talk about in a minute. And what do we get out of it? Well, first and foremost, performance. After developing such a storage data processor and performing some measurements with various applications, we're, we're seeing great numbers for all sorts of applications, from relational databases um, through like MariaDB and MySQL to solutions like Redis and Mongo and more. Performance improvements range between 2x and 15x. We'll add. Uh, we'll talk about key value APIs in the next slide. But I'd like to mention that if we replace storage engines such as RocksDB with a hardware accelerated KV engine, we get an improvement of even 40x. Capacity expansion. Uh, this storage data processor can add usable capacity by compressing the data effectively. It can do it at the block level below the application or file system compression. For example, we turned on MariaDB compression and even though MariaDB compression was on, we were able to compress another 60% uh, by the storage data processor. And this added capacity from all these operations could be used to improve system endurance or performance by over provisioning more space. Reliability. Cloud and infrastructure admins typically avoid using RAID, like we mentioned before, when SSD DAS environments are are related so and that's for reasons we mentioned earlier um, normal operation performance and endurance penalty and a performance killing rebuild that could well, 
happen when a drive fails. And even though people are keeping the data protected in other ways, using error correction algorithms across servers, across racks, or across data centers, losing a drive is still very painful. For example, in database applications, it might require intervention, rebuilding a whole node, et cetera. So everybody's looking for a way to avoid having a failed drive. With a storage data processor, though, preparing the data fully in cache in advance, uh, in a write-back cache, and then writing it sequentially all at once, it can stripe the data across all drives together and then write the parity only once. So we avoid a read, modify, write penalty, virtually eliminating both performance and endurance hits uh, from traditional RAID solutions. With the storage data processor, you can also solve the rebuild issue by performing rebuilds in parallel to writes. So read IORs are done in the foreground while writes and rebuild operations are performed asynchronously in the background. So performance hit during rebuild is just a few percentage. Uh, an important thing to note is we're seeing customers use such data protection features and still see better performance compared to software RAID 0, which is the fastest scraping out there. Uh, the last point is endurance. Customers are always looking for a way of increasing capacity at the same cost, and they would prefer drives like QLC, which are larger and cheaper. Uh, the issue with QLC drives is that they, their performance drops drastically when writes are random. But now with the storage data processor, which serializes and compresses the data, it greatly improves performance because it writes everything sequentially. And we can get to TLC performance at QLC economics. Another example is ZNS. It's intended to support different kinds of zones and take care of the noisy neighbor problem and generally reduce cost. But ZNS, well, vanilla ZNS would require work in the software. With a storage data processor that supports managed zones, this is all transparent to the file system and software. So in that, we talked about direct attached storage and, issue and, and how we combat issues with that. When going to disaggregation, these issues will be multiplied because in disaggregation, we're in a scenario we would, where we would want a single storage node to hold data for multiple app hosts. And well, we've had issues with the single host. Something that we would need to solve uh, in uh, multiple app uh, hosts with a single storage node is uh, is is add um, is the network latency, and we'll see that. And so, required element in storage data processor would probably be a key value engine, which would help ha help with that. And that's an abstraction layer. Let's see why. Okay. See. First of all, what's key value? Let's define that. Key value is an API which allows put and get and other operations on key value pairs. A key and the value are both strings of arbitrary length. Key value is not new. It's de facto the storage layer today in many systems that already exist. Starting from NoSQL data engines, such as Wired Tiger from MongoDB, which may, any of you may know, and those already speak in KV terms, mostly. But also through SQL databases, which are relational, but their underlying storage can be based on KV, and there are examples of that. Uh, all the way to block interfaces. Um, so wh why block and KV? Well, KV is an abstraction much stronger than block. We can think of it as a generalization of block. In block API, we have a logical block address, an LBA, of a fixed size mapped to, say, a four kilobyte block value. So it's clear why a block API is a special case of KV. And, and think about professional storage systems today, which have notions like compression, deduplication, thin provisioning. All these technologies could be implemented on top of a key value engine. For example, Key value gives you arbitrary size of keys and values. So compression can change the value size from a fixed four kilobyte to a variable length. And dedupe and thin provisioning can change the keys and values to be pointers instead of uh, regular, instead of uh, pointers to LBAs to data. On, on top of that, key value engines are also a good fit, fit for building analytic APIs on top of them, such as filtering, joins, aggregation, and more. So in short, key value exists. It's not really a new interface. It's essentially already there. Um, and all, all flash arrays, for example, all flash arrays you use them, for example, they might not call it key value, but they're performing operations that are based on key value ideas. 
Uh, now let's talk about the problem, which this is how a typical Here, storage think... stack would look like. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we, we just lost you for about five seconds. If you could start again, oh, with, uh, this is, let's talk about the problem right okay, at the beginning yeah. of this of slide uh, 20. Sorry about that. Um, in all the rehearsals, the rehearsal of the network works great. Uh, okay. So, st <laughs> yeah. So, um, the problem that key va value solves is uh, the problem of the storage engine. Modern order, modern data storing applications, um, such as relational databases, NoSQL databases, uh, distributed object storage or file systems, they have a user-facing layer that's depicted here in the top, and they use an underlying storage engine. The storage engine is a lower layer. It's responsible for managing the data on the drives. Um, it stores the data on the drives. It retrieves it from the drives for the application. The application does not work directly with the file system or block device beneath it. And the bottlenecks and amplifications in this system are actually in the storage engine. Um, like it's mentioned in, on the slide here. And the reason is that the storage engine typically keeps the data sorted for the databases. They're highly inefficient and prone to variable performance. The, the reason is that they map variable size data into fixed size blocks. And that's a difficult, that's a very difficult problem. Um, and there are various trade-offs you can make. You can uh, use a huge map in memory uh, to map this variable size data to fixed size blocks, or in some implementations, you can use less DRAM, but add more accesses to the flash in order to fetch the data. So there are various trade-offs. And there's also a, a CPU the, a cost. Um, these storage engines have a very high CPU cost for sorting and resorting the data and garbage collection between 30% and software-defined storage solutions to 80% or more in more complicated databases. So how can you start solving all these issues? Let's add a storage data processor and talk. So on the left-hand side here, I mentioned key value API. It's not exactly key value, but the application talks to storage engine in, in, similar, um, a, in, in a similar API. It doesn't have to be key value. But if we introduce uh, a thin software layer that replaces the storage engine, and translates APIs from these different applications, manages the storage data processor and the SSDs, it's going to solve many of the problems that the storage engine, engine introduces. Once a dedicated hardware is inserted to the system, such as an FPGA or ASIC in this storage data processor, then we can start using complicated data structures that give us IO performance. How would that work? Well. Simple offloading, a simple offloading processor would help with CPU functions like compression. And we did mention CPU usage is high with storage engines, so it could give some good. But while we're adding a dedicated hardware, there's an opportunity to insert more complex algorithms. And in software, they would be too complicated. They would take up too much CPU. But with dedicated hardware, you can implement algorithms and data structures that are not efficient in computation, but are actually very efficient in IO bandwidth. When the computational load is reduced, do you just to this hardware acceleration? And the IO is reduced thanks to these uh, complex data structures. We get the best of, best of both worlds. And that's by adding this smart storage data processor. And we'll see how it helps us in a minute and go to this. We talked about the problems and how we face them today in, in today's model. Looking with, with the, using a storage data processor, now let's look back here on this slide and talk about tomorrow's data, cent data structure, uh, data center. We call it a data centric approach uh, because uh, disaggregated, disaggregating the storage from the CPU, we can gain all the benefits John mentioned earlier on disaggregated storage and some cost benefits as well because we don't need a CPU here in this uh, storage node. 
So when moving to a disaggregated model, we want to scale the storage nodes independently from the CPU node, just like John mentioned. And we want a single storage node to support many compute nodes, as many as possible. We're also adding another communication layer though, the network. And this network is going to become the main bottleneck very quickly, even with very high speed NICs. And there are benefits when using block interface in this model, by the way, which are similar to the benefits we talked in today's slides. But uh, in order to get the best performance and scale and cost, we're going to have to use key value API. And that's the, that will allow us much better performance and um, yeah, much better performance in this in this this aggregated model. Sorry. So how would that work? Earlier, when we looked at at the slide, we're talking about local storage. Now we added a cloud drawing just between the storage and then and the SSD, and that means that we have a network there. And this network between them is getting all the traffic amplification we talked about earlier. The, this write read amplification is not local anymore. And all of these would cause you know, network latency, congestion, uh, reducing throughput altogether, and not allow us to scale out or up as much as we want. The, the blue, uh, yeah, so um, at the bottom, the SSDs, they, they and, and storage data processor on the right, they are uh, located on a separate storage node that would receive these incoming writes and persist them to the flash. Um, the numbers in the slide we see here were published by Facebook in OCP Summit in uh, 2018. And they relate to the traffic ampli uh, amplification that they observed on the network when trying to move to a disaggregated model. They use Myrox, a SQL database, and it was it's actually implemented over RocksDB um, as a storage engine. And RocksDB writes to the file system over the network. So 100 megabytes of application traffic were amplified 30x to three gigabytes per second over the network. And from storage engine, ju just from the storage engine to the remote file system. And if you think about three gigabits per second, that's 24 gigabits per second. So just four of these incoming apps traffic would saturate uh, 100 gig NIC. And applications, well, they want more than 100 megabytes today, maybe. And we'd also like to support more than just four applications on the server and more than and many more servers per storage node. So this simplification is simply a performance killer. Um, once applications go, you know, incur it over the network. But as we see in a, on the right-hand side, when we add a storage data processor that exposes a thin RocksDB compatible API layer, layer, for example, then the problem is totally gone because the network traffic is, is only the original application traffic of 100 megabytes per second. And if there is some write amplification due to the storage data processor itself, it's, it's local inside the storage node and not over the network. And we have much more bandwidth within the server. So that's not a problem. So this network traffic amplification reduction is imperative for very high performance storage aggregation. And if there are many other solutions for storage aggregation today, don't get me wrong, but for high performance databases, applications, um, you know, hyper, like we mentioned, hyperscalers, enterprises today, they use DAS. For example, AWS or Aurora uses DAS in RDBS. Facebook, with their requirements for high-performance databases, use DAS in large scale and, and more. By the way, just moving the storage engine to a separate host would, would reduce the network amplification, but still require a lot of CPU. But the hardware acceleration from the storage data processor removes that bottleneck as well and makes this a full solution. So in summary, moving to native KV solves the network bottleneck and adding the storage data processor covers the CPU bottom. Together with the DPU, we get a full package with all the benefits that John has mentioned. And um, isolation, oh, yeah. So 
what we get is isolation, security, independent scale, and great cost savings. And that's just from the disaggregated model. And when you add, when you add uh, the DPU, uh, the, sorry, the storage data processor benefits we, uh, with KV, we also get the performance, capacity, reliability, and endurance. And this is how we see the solution for building high performance disaggregated storage solutions in the future. Back to you, John. Kafir, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, and let me expand on what you just presented with a little discussion of use cases. So you know, now that we've seen what you can do with a storage data processor and with the DPU, what are some use cases for applying these? So I think one use case is a distributed SDS or software defined storage. And that's like the example you gave with Ceph. What you can do is you have you know, a storage layer that's distributed that's making queries to the SSDs that are somewhat complex. And if you replace the default storage engine, like in Ceph, the normal engine, there was the original one, then there's Blue Store, which is an improved version. But you replace that software storage engine with the storage data processor and you get better efficiency and better scale uh, and then by adding the DPU, you can also get better security. And that's because as you see, you no longer get this data amplification between the uh, storage application or Ceph, uh, uh, or it could be a shared file system and between the SSDs. So again, by getting rid of the amplification, you reduce the amount of traffic and improve the performance. And it, uh, it turns out that I think with the DPU, people might say, well, if you reduce the amount of storage traffic, then maybe the DPU isn't as helpful because the DPU, one of the things that's really good at accelerating is all the networking, the, the raw physical networking, as well as RDMA or direct memory access through the over the network, as well as uh, other network offloads like overlay networking uh, or network encryption. But I, my feeling is that whenever you improve the efficiency, if you reduce the amplification, people, the way people respond with their applications is not that they use less networking, they use the they end up running more data. They say, wow, the performance is better, the right amplification is down. I'm going to make more queries or more complicated, more complex queries and run bigger data sets. So, uh, uh, so interestingly enough, increasing the efficiency or reducing the amount of traffic per query probably actually leads to more queries and more traffic, not less. Seems counterintuitive, but I think that's what I actually observe when people find ways to uh, increase, you know, the performance of uh, distributed databases or distributed file systems. So distributed software-defined storage, very popular in the cloud, popular if used in uh, high-performance computing or HPC as well. So that's a great use case that's available today with the storage data processor. A second one is databases. So, uh, and this is more emphasis on the NoSQL databases, but not only NoSQL, it could also be like uh, MySQL, which is a very popular you know, open source database uh, that's used a lot, uh, again, a lot in the web cloud for web, web farms, uh, corporate intranets, corporate, uh, corporate private cloud and hybrid cloud. Uh, and then, and same with, and then it turns out that these applications usually run by default, a data translation engine underneath of something like RocksDB, which is used for MongoDB or InnoDB, which is under normally underlying MySQL or Maria or underneath MariaDB. Again, when you replace this, you get a higher efficiency, you reduce the data amplification or eliminate that amplification as you're going into the SSDs. And therefore you get better performance, better endurance, uh, you know, more lifespan out of your SSDs or the ability to use, enjoy the capacity of like TLC and QLC SSDs, even though they have lower endurance, that's okay because the storage data processor has uh, reduced the amplification and therefore extended the lifespan or the effectively increased the endurance of those SSDs and you save money. And so this is very important for cloud, web, and analytics. And that brings me to the next use case, which is big data analytics or data analysis. This typically involves very large volumes of data, and it often has distributed queries and a distributed database. Uh, and many times it could be a NoSQL database or a MySQL or a MariaDB. Uh, and so again, you have this combination of large amounts of data distributed around, and you have database engines and in some cases, you're using key, you know, key value queries because for data analysis, I think the trend is to move um, more into things that are key value queries or look like, or in fact, rely on, run on top of a key value interface. So again, that storage data processor is gonna increase that efficiency and probably give you a longer lifespan out of your SSDs when you're using flash storage. 
Uh, and in addition, using the DPU will handle that high, the higher network traffic because again, you've, you've increased the performance of the flash, you've increased the efficiency of the software interface to the storage, uh, and that means more queries going in and out of the box. And if the storage is distributed or separated from the boxes with the CPUs, as we talked about with this disaggregation, you need that fast, efficient, low latency networking between the storage nodes and the compute nodes uh, to make it work and be efficient. So again, you know, you want to basically, you're playing a game of leapfrog to eliminate the bottlenecks. SSDs got faster. Now the storage processing and the storage software has to get faster. And then the network has to get faster. Uh, and all, they all work together to give you better performance and better efficiency. And going forward in the future, uh, I think there, there are going to be use cases, uh, which Sneha has been talking about, where you have computational storage, where the storage is doing the queries. I think that's one of the big use cases going forward. And we talk about distributing the queries to multiple server nodes. Now the queries can be distributed even further, not just to different compute nodes, but to different storage devices or storage processors. So now the dedicated storage nodes can do the compute. And in the future, I could see a future where a storage data processor uh, is running, actually help running queries or coordinating queries with SSDs that are doing the queries. So whether you wanna do the query in the SSD or the storage data processor or both, I think that's uh, that's likely to be happening in the future. Uh, and again, the, even though that may, doing the query on the storage theoretically reduces the amount of data that has to be returned over the network, uh, I think it inevitably leads to people running more queries on more on larger volumes of data and therefore the network traffic stays the same or in fact increases. Uh, and then the other possibility for the future is very fast object storage on flash. So traditionally, you know, this object storage uses key values, but traditionally people haven't demanded very much performance from it. They've run it on hard drives. Even when the databases were all on flash, people would say, oh, my videos, my uh, voicemail recordings, my pictures, my, lo my machine logs, I'll put those on hard object storage, on slow object storage, on hard drives. But as they find more and more use cases to move object storage to flash, this is a natural fit for, for some kind of storage data processor which can use key value storage uh, because object storage it sort of, you know, it uses even is more of a native user of key value than perhaps block storage is. Okay, so those are some use cases going forward. And oh, I see we have a couple of questions. Please keep your questions coming and we're going to, Tim's going to send those questions to me and Kafir at the end. And uh, if there are questions we can't get to, we, I think we might publish them in a blog, the answers in a blog. But key takeaways. So what did we discuss today? Well, first of all, CPU power has not kept up with storage performance or storage capacity. So when you had hard drives, well, the capacity kept going up, but the performance, the relative performance per terabyte was actually going down. So the CPUs didn't have any trouble keeping up uh, with the performance of hard drives. But with flash, the performance and the capacity are increasing faster than CPU power because Moore's law is dead. So CPUs you know, are, are no longer in doubling in power every 18 months. They're now increasing in a linear pace instead of an exponential pace, their performance. But storage is increasing in a faster pace in terms of capacity and performance. So traditional storage architecture is hitting the limits for bigger customers, bigger databases, bigger data lakes. You're going to hit these limits where traditional storage architecture is not going to work and you need to look at you know, uh, disaggregating the storage. Uh, new solutions storage data processor, it changes the way that you that applications or even storage software talks to the physical storage to increase efficiency and performance and the data processing unit, the DPU. It makes the networking more efficient. It can offload uh, some of the higher level storage software onto the DPU while the lower level storage functions go to the storage data processor. Uh, and it can uh, offload some security functions like data encryption uh, as well as monitoring and management, and basically takes all this infrastructure work away from the CPU so the CPU can focus on running applications. Uh, or in a dedicated storage box, an EBOF or a JBOF, uh, you, the GPU might actually take over from the CPU completely, and there may not be any need to have a dedicated x86 CPU if you're running a thin layer of storage software that can run entirely on some combination of the SDP and the DPU. So by using the SDP or the DPU or using them together, you can improve the efficiency, the scale, the isolation and cost. You're going to get enhanced uh, computational storage solution, uh, you know, especially when you're using bigger and faster SSDs. And in going forward, we can look at ways to get higher capacity, better endurance, better performance, and effectively lower cost per terabyte or petabyte uh, from flash storage by taking advantage of these different kinds of hardware acceleration.
So I think any large enterprise, any cloud service provider, big system integrators who do a large storage implementations should be looking at an SDP and the DPU and figuring out, you know, do these make sense? If I'm going to do storage aggregation, how can I use these to make it a better implementation, improve the performance, security, manageability, and lower the cost? All right. So let me turn that over to you, Tim. And Tim, do we have, uh, once you wrap it up and let us know if we have any questions. Oh, you bet. Thanks, John. <clears throat> Looks like we don't have the Q&A slide in there. This says very end. We'll come back to the other ones here in a minute. But let's get into some questions and answers real quick. Uh, the first question we have here, what is the difference between using a storage processor and using an SSD that does computational storage? Uh, it sounds like that one might uh, be a good one for you, Kiefer, to, to answer. Yes. Uh, Tim, maybe you want to go to the presenter's video? You bet. And show us. OK. Here we go. So, hi, everyone. Um, so you were saying, what's the difference between using a storage processor and an SSD? So an SSD with computational storage. Right. So well. A storage data processor, the difference is the story, there's a several differences. One of the key differences is a storage data processor is a turnkey solution. I mean, a computational storage requires integration into software. And with the storage data processor, it's less effort to integrate. It gives you, it depends on what APIs you use. But for example, if you use block API, it's um, it, it's a turnkey solution. You insert the storage data processor, you get a block device, uh, you put a file system over it, and any application works, um, you know, it's very simply. With uh, key value API, you would need some kind of integration, um, but that's relatively low to you know, um, computational storage where you need to define functions and run on the SSD. Also, um, some of these computational storage drives give you an ARM processor. With dedicated hardware uh, in the storage data processor, like FPGA or ASIC, you can use dedicated services, such as indexing, uh, smart data structures, like we showed today, to give you um, much better performance uh, than a general processor. And uh, lastly, the storage data processor is a computational storage array and not a single drive. And as an array, you can do things above several drives. For example, implement RAID, which you couldn't do at the drive level. And also get write atomicity and power fill atomicity. If, and those can't be done at the SSD level. And you know, many cases for a high performance application, um, people would use RAID zero striping above the drives in order to get you know, the, the high performance. So you wouldn't get atom atomicity if you use um, just a single drive. Great, thank you. I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here and this one I'm gonna throw out to you, John. Uh, there's two questions I'm gonna try to combine them the best I can, but first one is, is um, what are the advantages of using a DPU instead of a normal network card? And then the second, does the DPU typically use DMA to access server memory and communicate with other components? Yeah, sure. So first of all, the DPU can use DMA. Uh, it definitely and often does. It can do this over both locally and over the network. So locally, it goes over the PCIe bus. And uh, on the network, it would use things like, for example, RDMA over InfiniBand or over Ethernet uh, to directly access the memory on another machine. And that could be the memory for a CPU or a GPU uh, or the memory for a storage array. So DMA is typically used, yes. Uh, and then, Tim, the other question was the difference between a DPU and a standard network card. So these days, standard network cards uh, often do some basic network offloads, like they'll do TCP, basic TCP, uh, large, you know, LRO and LSO offloads, large receive and send offloads. Um, and, uh, many, and then many of them can actually do RDMA. But what the DPU adds is the ability to provide isolation and some programmable programmability. So normal network cards are very can really accelerate a certain small number of fixed tasks and the DPU usually includes that ability as well but the DPU also can be programmed to for example do select have the network card select certain packets and then inspect those packets or forward those packets uh, or, or you know 
or uh, class that reclassify certain flows using the programmable processors on the DPU. And then many DPUs also have additional accelerators that are not found in standard network cards. Accelerators, uh, for example, for scanning data or doing hashing or uh, some other high running high level storage software you know, in the cores. And those are some of the things you can't do with a standard network uh, card. Great, thanks, John. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of confusion. There's a question came in saying, looking at how SNEA defines a DPU, isn't the SDP also a DPU? So maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about the difference between the storage data processor and a DPU. Sure. Um, maybe can, we can both answer that. So um, a DPU is typically used for network functions or light storage functions related to network. Uh, with a storage data processor, it, it's something else. It's a compute. Uh, it's a computational storage device. It's a computational storage array working above the storage nodes and doing all the storage functions. And it's uh, it it, it, could, it could be programmable like uh, computational storage devices, and it has special accelerators designed to handle the storage problems we mentioned, like performance, uh, give, give you performance, give you RAID, and all these uh, accelerators that typically do not exist on, the, on a DPU. And it can also give you uh, an API such as a key value API, um, which is uh, dedicated, which, you know, there, there could be key value APIs in other, in other layers, um, but the, the, it could replace the storage engine as well and give you a, a more rich API. Yeah, Tim, let me add on to that. I, I think what Kafir said is all, all, I agree with all of that. In addition, DPUs uh, typically don't accelerate low level storage functions. DPUs, when they do accelerate storage, they're doing things like accelerating networking storage protocols, like uh, some of them accelerate NVMe over fabrics, uh, uh, or they're accelerating uh, higher level storage features, um, like maybe they're running some of the file, a distributed file system software on the DPU, but the actual trend, the storage engine that talks to the SSDs would run on the storage data processor. So obviously there are different DPUs that do different things and there could be exceptions, but generally speaking, a DPU, when it does something in storage is doing something at a higher level. Uh, and it's usually more, it's, uh, it's very fast hardware accelerated functions are usually more on the networking and security side or, in, or, or telemetry and remote management. Great, we, um, this, we're not gonna have time to get through all the questions. Obviously we'll, we'll, do, we'll follow up with a, uh, uh, a blog with that gets to the answer of these, but this one kind of follows along with where uh, you guys just answered. It's that question is where does the storage intelligence live? The CPU, the DPU, or the SDP? Hmm. Who wants to take that one on? So, I, I'll, I'll start. I I, so yeah, go go ahead. Okay. John. So uh, generally, the lower level, the the lower the level of the storage intelligence, the more likely it's going to be in the SDP or possibly the SSD. So, for example, the you know the, the literal mapping uh, to individual chips, uh, uh, NAND chips, would usually be in the SSD. But then doing uh, wear leveling or garbage collection or RAID across the SSDs could be in the SDP storage data processor. You know that's something that wouldn't happen in the DPU. But then again, running a piece of a, a, a Lustre or Ceph file system or software or management software that's more likely to run on the DPU as well as the networking. Um, and, and including accelerated networking or encrypted network uh, network protocols. Anything to add there, Kiver, or are we? Uh... No, I think John got it right. Okay. Perfectly, thank you. I uh, just want to thank uh, both of you for uh, uh, bringing us uh, all the, uh, the educational material that you did today. Uh, we're going to jump real quick to just the last few slides here as we're just a little bit over time. Uh, again, um, we want to thank everybody for joining, and we'd like you to ask you to rate this webcast and give us some feedback. The presentation was available and is still available within the uh, announcements section here in uh, Bright Talk. As well, there will be a PDF on our website. There's a link available right there for you. You'll also find this webcast and others in our video and presentations library. You can find uh, many different topics that will be covered. And then the Q&A from this webcast will be posted in the SNEA Com Compute Memory and Storage blog, which will be followed up with in the next few days. 
Um, if you're interested, you can find more material. The website is snea.org slash CMSI. Also follow us on Twitter for more information, find out what's going on. Um, and in the CMSI blog, there's a link to that as well. Uh, and uh, additional videos, educational material can also be found out on either YouTube or the uh, SNEA Educational Library site. Uh, again, we'd like to thank uh, the presenters for uh, the effort today and everybody for joining. And uh, we'll call, bring this presentation to an end. Goodbye. <laughs>